Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, what I would like to do in this lecture is continue our discussion about fitting data. Now, in the previous lecture, I introduced you to essentially lines of best fits. Now, I did it in the context of linear dynamical systems. And what we saw is that we have different measures of distances that can help us or hurt us when it comes to doing these fitting problems. In particular, we have all of these P norms, and we saw that the best one typically for handling outliers is P equal to 1. But it comes with the issue that a lot of the time it's a hard function to differentiate. It has an absolute value in it, right? That has a non-continuous derivative. These are things that we learn in basic calculus courses. So typically we like to use maybe P equal to 2 for these kind of things. Now, what I would like to focus on is an extension of this to nonlinear functions, right? So the process is mostly the same. So we can imagine, again, that we're given a bunch of data points, let's say a bunch of points, let's imagine they are in R2, so I'm just going to keep everything simple. You can always sort of uh, extend the dimensions here if you want to. Things just become a little uglier. But this is what I know I'm doing now, this is what I'm doing next. Doing now, doing next, okay? So these are points sampled from some process. Uh, that are going to be fit to a uh, dynamical system. So the idea here is, instead of looking for a linear relationship between x and y, we'd like to look for a nonlinear relationship. And in particular, maybe we want to fit to a polynomial. So, for example, let's try and find a polynomial that can do this. squared all the way up to some polynomial degree. I'm going to call D for degree, okay? So you get to choose what the polynomial degree is. Maybe if you're using the yeast model, you want to fit it to a logistic mapping, then you would use degree two, right? Because we know that the logistic mapping is just a nice little hump function. But in this case, now, we have a vector of coefficients that need to be fit to the data. My coefficients are the coefficients in this, or the coefficients of each one of these polynomials. You can think of this as potentially being like a Taylor expansion. So if I was in the context of the previous video, I only went up to linear order. I was only tuning the y-intercept and the slope. But now I've got way more terms on here, but the basic process remains because the idea is that I am trying to discover a relationship that would give me a discrete time dynamical process which is given by f of xn which f would be c0 plus c1 x of n plus c2 x of n squared all the way up to my dth degree. Okay, so I don't want you to lose sight of what I'm actually trying to do here. Input, output, x of n, x of n plus 1, right? So I know how to get from one step to the next. I know what happens. I just need to figure out the function that does that for me. This data could be sequential, right? It could be hour 0, hour 1, hour 1, hour 2, hour 2, hour 3, you know, hour 100, our 101. For example, right? I'm just trying to fit the process that takes me from what I'm doing now to what I'm doing next. That's how my data is given to me. What I'm doing now, what I'm doing next. But that means that I can set up exactly the same kind of problem that I had before. I can look at an error function. My error function, again, as a value of p is chosen. Now my error function takes in my coefficients of my polynomial and fits them according to a p norm. So uh, let's do i equal to 1 all the way up to n. This is going to be yi, the output, minus the input, right? So I want this whole thing to be equal, that's the same as if I put a minus here, that's equal to zero. So I get minus c0 
plus C1 XI plus dot 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 CD X, uh, sorry, I to the D, all to the power of P, and then I'm doing a P norm of that error vector. Again, just trying to match inputs to outputs. If this, if each component here was zero, that means I perfectly matched this input to output. Okay, that's all that's happening here. Now, now we have to look at something interesting about this, right? The input is d plus one dimensional. Remember, in the last video, it was only a two-dimensional input, right? So I couldn't even just like plot the loss function or this error function, and I could figure out maybe where the minimum is just from a little plot, nothing too fancy, right? Well, here now, if I go even up to quadratic order, it's a three-dimensional uh, input and a one-dimensional output. So things get a little hard, right? And in particular, things in real life are typically very nonlinear. So maybe I need a high polynomial degree. Maybe I need to go up to degree 100 in order to get a good fit for my data. That would mean that I have a 101 dimensional input and I have one big ugly polynomial that I have to look at whenever this process is done, right? So it's possible that, you know, maybe a 100 dimensional polynomial is a good fit, but think about how awful these coefficients could look, right? Uh, 0 0.98632, 127.629, negative 39.68, you know, whatever these numbers happen to be, they're just horrible, horrible numbers. Well, this would be the optimal setup, right? Again, with p equal to 1, that would help you get rid of outliers, the same thing that we saw in the previous video. Uh, you could use p equal to 2 because it makes things a little bit better behaved, but... We would like to try to make the function that comes out of this at least a little more interpretable, okay? So here's the big trade-off when it comes to data science. I can get really maybe accurate descriptions of the data by just going to really high polynomial degree. Something that you have done throughout your mathematical career though is probably avoid very, very complicated, ugly functions. Why? Because they're hard to work with. They take a long time, right? Differentiating a degree 100 polynomial, okay, maybe that's not that bad, but if you have to differentiate all 101 terms in this thing, then it becomes a lot of work and it becomes a lot of accounting to keep track of, especially if these coefficients are large. So what we do typically is we do a little bit of an augmenting of our function. So we introduce a different error function. Let's call it E tilde to emphasize that it's different. And I get a value of P and Q. And again, the input is the coefficients. Okay, so the first piece of this is my original input, okay? So bear with me while I write this out. C1, Xi all the way up, x i to the d, and then to the power of p, to the one over p. But I'm gonna add a little term on the end of this. Okay, so I have my original error function plus a value lambda, and then the q norm of c. Okay, so notice there's a p and a q in here. The p norm, describes the measure of the error. The Q norm describes the size of the coefficients. This is called a regularization parameter. So regularization parameter. It is gonna be positive. It could even be zero. If it's equal to zero, you get your original process back here. So what is the regulariz regularization parameter doing? Well, let's break this into two different components, okay? The first component here is asking that you fit your data. Okay, that's, that's a reasonable assumption, right? That's what we were trying to do here. The second component says, okay, if you're gonna fit the data, at least try and give me small coefficients in, in the coefficient vector, right? 
So that's what this is doing. The larger lambda is, the more of a preference you have for small coefficients, okay? Because, again, you want to make this as small as possible. The ideal way to make this small is have both of these terms be zero. But that's not going to happen. So to make this thing small, you have to have both of them be small together. So you have to have a small size of your vector of coefficients and a good fit for your data. Now, there's a few different things that you can see here. First of all, if lambda is equal to zero, it says just fit my data. I don't care what the coefficients are. They could be big, they could be small, you know, they could be whatever. Just give me the best fit possible. That might be what you're looking for, right? If you're gonna do this on the computer, you know, and you're not gonna do any analysis with your system, then take lambda equal to zero. But me personally, I like to sit down and crunch the numbers, right? I like to do the pencil and paper math when once I'm done. I spent all this time in this class learning all of these methods to analyze these systems. I might as well put them to use. So what I would like is I would like a system that I can actually interpret. So once you start turning lambda on, now it's giving a bit of a preference to smaller coefficients. So you have this balancing act taking place here, okay? So not only is it trying to fit the data, but it's sacrificing a bit of the fit to give you interpretability. In fact, the, if lambda gets really, really big, the best way to make this thing small is just make small coefficients because this is really overinflated in the sum, right? Take lambda equal to a million, for example. Well then, this thing basically has a baseline of a million. So the best way to make this thing go down is just make a smaller vector. Okay, so now you can see that there's two limits. Very, very small lambda means fit the data really, really well. I don't care what the coefficients look like. Very, very big lambda means, okay, don't worry so much about the data. Spend your time making those coefficients small. And then you can see that there's some sort of Goldilocks zone in the middle that is sort of where you want to hit, right? Pretty good fit for the data, but also, you know, not too big of coefficients. Now, that means that lambda is what we call a hyperparameter of the system. It is something that needs to be chosen before you do the optimization here, right? Before you, do, before you find the values of C, you need to choose what lambda is. This makes it a bit of a pain, right? Typically, in practice, what we do is we do this over a bunch of different values of lambda and we decide which one of those, those optimizers, the values of C, is gonna give us the best, uh, the best fit for our data in terms of what we want out of this, right? So this becomes a complicated process, right? This is really sort of hard data science right here because now you have to do a little bit of decision making before you go into this. But this is true math modeling. Go all the way back to the first couple lectures here, right? You have to make assumptions and borrow from other people when you're doing this, right? And your assumption might be, you know, again, if you're me, maybe I want Lambda a little bit larger. Maybe I want Lambda like 10 or 100 or something like that because I really care about having small coefficients. I want to be able to do the math, right? I want to be able to work with this thing. I want, you know, linearizations around this that I can actually look at the numbers and figure out what's going on. But again, maybe you're a biologist or something like that and you don't want to do the math. You just want the perfect fit. You want to be able to predict what's going to happen in the future. Then you just make Lambda super, super small. Now, in particular, there's what's called the lasso method. Now the lasso method typically takes P equal to two. Why? Because that makes everything sort of smooth. It makes it really easy to work with when you're doing derivatives here. But it also takes Q equal to one. And this Q equal to one here is like the ultimate regularizer because it treats every coefficient of C equally. Everybody should be small together. If Q was bigger, say 10 or 100, then it is putting more preference on the big coefficients, right? It's trying to shrink the big ones more than it's trying to shrink the small ones. Why? Let's imagine you get a vector that looks like this. One, 
in 10. You take a Q norm of this. Okay, so I get 1 to the power of Q plus 10 to the power of Q to the 1 over Q. Okay. If Q is equal to 1, then both of those things are treated equally. And you just sort of get 11 here. But if Q is bigger, say 10, this thing still stays at 1. But this thing goes 10 to the 10. Right? So that has an outsized influence. So if you are trying to fit this data, you're trying to clamp that one down as much as possible. And you don't really care about this one over here. It's the same thing that we saw in the previous video with larger values of P favoring outliers, right? You spend more time working on the ones that are super big and trying to crush them down than you do, you know, focusing on everybody. So the reason that we typically use Q equal to one, at least for this, this regularized term, this regularizer term, is because you want to treat everybody equally. You want them all to be small together. You don't want to preference outliers. You don't want to just make one of the coefficients super small and then the rest of them kind of just medium. You want everybody to be small all together. Okay, so you can see this can get pretty complicated pretty fast, right? You could have a lot of data. It could, it, this could easily be extended to higher dimensions. You have different values of P and Q that you can choose. You have a different, different values of lambda that will give you different results depending on it. You know, there's a lot of human decision making that goes into this before you can, you know, get something interpretable out of it. And that's where you come in, right? You have to decide what it is that you want and what it is you want to preference, right? So this requires an intimate knowledge of the data and what you're trying to get out of this. Personally, I like doing math. I want to do, I want something that I can do math on. But again, keep your biologist friend in mind, right? Maybe your physicist or your chemist friend. They might just want something that gives them predictions into the future. Okay, I'll see you in the next lecture, everybody.